everyone. Welcome to yet another OPN Dev Talk. I am unfortunately still your host because they haven't gotten rid of me yet. Steven, I swear it's an actual name, Staniszewski. I also go by Slave to Machine on Steam and Skype and all that other fun stuff. With me today is Mark Ng. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Ng, sir? Uh, yes, it is. Mark Ng from Clapfoot Games. He is the co-founder and one of the programmers of a game that just recently came out. Uh, by the name of Fortified. It was released just earlier this month on Steam. I'm also here with Shane, who is a, a recent addition to the team, and the man that cannot speak, Eli, who is running production. So if things go wrong, we're going to blame the engineer. So first off, Mark, again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're not going to take up too much of your time, but tell us a little bit about your... How did you get into the gaming industry? Yeah, um, so I had a couple of jobs um, at a bunch of other gaming studios um, a long time ago. I worked at uh, Electronic Arts for a short while. Okay. Um, I worked for another company here in Toronto called Trends Gaming, and what they did was they ported games from the PC over to the Mac. Um, so I so I had some a few years of experience. In the industry and um, at some point five six years ago as a hobby I just decided to work on some projects on the side and one of them was a mobile project called uh, Tank Hero mm -hmm. it's a very small mobile title and I was able to drag one of my um, friends and prior co-workers um, to work on that title with me and at the time um, we decided to put it onto Android instead of the iPhone, which is such a crazy idea at the time, but it was when Android was really, really small. There was only like one phone that was available for Android. And luckily, because we were one of the only games on that platform, um, we were able to find some success there. And eventually we quit our full-time jobs and we were able to um, start a studio. And that was sort of the uh, starting point of Clapfoot. So I have to admit, I haven't really played a lot of the older mobile games. I noticed that you guys did a lot of mobile work and that it looks to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Fortified is the first uh, PC platform game. Uh, yeah, so we did mobile titles for around three to four years. Mm -hmm. And um, it's kind of funny because a lot of the stuff that we were trying to do in the mobile space was actually sort of take the console-ish type of experiences and shrink the scale and try to put it down into a phone game um, or a tablet game. And and eventually, so the console PC gaming space was sort of something that we always wanted to do. Um, it was at the back of our minds, but we just weren't really sure what the right time was. And the barriers to entry um, were quite higher four or five years ago than they were now. And um, one of our, and it got to the point where we finished our last mobile title about two years ago. It was called uh, Hero Forge. It's a puzzle fighting multiplayer game. And um, while working on that title, one of the things we found that was a little bit restricting was that the mobile market was starting to make this turn um, towards free to play being the dominant monetization model. And, and um, that just kind of put a lot of restrictions on on what we felt we were able to do. So it was sort of like the perfect excuse for us to be like, okay, well, since we always wanted to do a console game and now we've, we've been feeling a lot of these restrictions on the mobile side, you know, maybe now is the time to do it. So, so we, um, and also at the time, the new consoles were coming out. So there was this new opportunity to, to, to sort of be um, early-ish on the, on the new consoles. I mean, the consoles are no longer new now, but at the time they were sort of new. So um, sort of with all these factors involved, we were able to make the jump from mobile to uh, console and PC. And um, yeah, sort of uh, where we were before and where we are now. So what was it that changed? You, know, you mentioned five years ago. And by the way, I, I haven't gotten a chance to play Tank Hero, I admit, but 
Uh, it looks like one of the old style Atari games where you're just controlling the tank, you're just rolling around. And it, it seems like that is something, I mean, I remember when I was growing up, I played you know, Battle Tanks and uh, there were a couple of other games. Tempest was, no, Tempest was totally different. Excuse me, Battle Zone, I think it was. It, yeah, there was Battle City as well for yeah. the NES. Yes. That was sort of one of the main uh, inspirations for it. And <laughs> And it, it's kind of, you know, it hasn't really held up, to be honest, after all, after all these years. So, um, so if you if you take a look at it now, it's sort of like, whoa, like these graphics are not that great. And <laughs> so, but um, yeah. So I mean, was was Tank Hero uh, something that you might have like started in college? Because we talked to a lot of devs, and a lot of them all say kind of the same thing, where. It was, oh, it was just something I, I worked on on the weekends. It was for a school project. I, was it a situation where this is something you always wanted to do? I mean, absolutely bar none. Or, or was this just something you kind of stumbled into? Um, it's, it's kind of a little bit of both, to okay. be honest. Like, I, I sort of, you know, obviously it's, it's always been a dream to um, being able to uh, make the games that I want to make or work with um, a studio with a lot of creative freedom, but um, it's not always, the opportunities aren't always there. And I think I, it's not like I had this huge sort of plan. I was like, okay, five years ago specifically, I'm going to start it then. It was sort of like I had it at the back of my mind for the longest time. And when the barriers to entry were low enough on the mobile platforms um, and there was a lot of other people doing it, um, it was sort of like, okay, well, now is the opportunity. Now, since I've always wanted to do it, now is sort of the time. And I was able to um, find the time, which I kind of look back and don't even know how I was able to find all that time <laughs> outside of my full-time job. Because it's sort of like, I'm sure you've heard this so many times, but it's like, you know, you finish your full-time job at six o'clock and then you go <laughs> home and you work on this other game, this other project, you know, all the way until like midnight. And then, um, and you do that for like four or five months or so, however long it takes. And, so, and then, yeah. So, so speaking of fortified, um, how long have you had this game in mind? Like, is this a game that you've been ultimately working towards to create, or is this something that kind of like, okay, here's the next step, let's come up with something fresh? Um, well, I think one of the things that we were really interested in doing is a multiplayer game. Um, I think that part of it was in the plan for at least a while. Um, in terms of Fortified as a game as it is now, a part of that was created on the fly and a part of it um, I'd say was it comes more from the fact of wanting to make a four player co-op game I think that was the part that was definitely there for a while because there was there's definitely a few of us on the team that really enjoyed the idea of that type of game that you play with your friends sort of like after work and you know you just want to sit down and have a good time with three of your friends. And it's sort of like a hangout game that, that you can play, but where you really have to like strategize. And if you lose, then you got to go back to the drawing board. You kind of have to come up with a new strategy. So I think that part was definitely something that we want to do. And then all the other parts of it, like um, the theme and perhaps some of the specific features was made right. sort of as we worked on the title. So regarding the theme, what made you choose like 1950s? What was it about the 50s that you were like, okay, this is what we have to do? Um, well, it's kind of funny because we didn't start off with that theme. It actually, the game started off being more of um, a darker, suspenseful theme where you played as a space engineer on like a derelict ship and there was, you know, a whole bunch of uh, aliens that would um, swarm out of the vents and and it was still like a defense game, but um, we worked on a prototyping that for a few months. And I think w one of the th reasons why we didn't end up going with that sort of direction was because we felt like there was a disconnect between what the game, where the gameplay was going and where that theme was. Cause we found that the gameplay was starting to um, have these elements like 
like the physics being really like over the top and like ridiculous. And then yet the, the, the theme was really serious. So they didn't really work that well together. And um, at the time, myself and the other, uh, the other co-founder of the studio, we, we sat down and we looked at the prototype and we're like, you know what, this is just not really working out. Like, I don't know what it is, but it's not really working out. And then we um, came with this idea, hey, what if the game was kind of like that scene in uh, Sky Captain and the World Tomorrow where there's these like huge Martian robots, they come down from space, they're kind of like marching down the street and you're in charge of the military and you're fighting these robots. And we sort of just took that concept and um, we made a new prototype and um, that's sort of how the theme uh, uh, came, came about. about. Huh? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because like when I see that, I immediately think of like the movie Mars Attack. Yes. So that's what kind of like drew me to the game immediately. I love that 50s feel with like the invasion of Martians. I don't know if that was something you guys thought about or seen or... Have you yeah, even seen Mars yeah. Attack? Yes, yeah. We've, we've definitely seen that movie. And there was also another comic. It's called uh, Magnus Robot Fighter. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you've looked that up before, but it's this guy who, um, he wears a skirt and he punches robots all day. That's kind of his job. <laughs> <laughs> that is the and best job ever, by the way. It's the best job ever. And <laughs> that's sort of where the superhero um, side of the side of the theme sort of came about so we sort of took the idea from sky captain and world tomorrow like the military versus these martian robots but rather than play, playing as like a military dude you'd be playing as a superhero so it's sort of like the marriage of those two concepts that's awesome dude um also too i forgot to say thanks for uh, tuning into the show today i appreciate you coming by um also, too, I noticed that you attended the University of Waterloo, which I'm sure that was a pretty big thing for you. I know they rank among one of the highest schools in Canada. Um, <laughs> did uh, did you do you work with anybody from the, your time at the university, or do you have ideas that you were working at the university and you're like, when I get older, this is what I'm going to do when I get out of here? <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't think I thought too far ahead back then. <laughs> to be honest. It's actually been quite a long time since I... I'd been in school, um, but there was definitely one course I took in school that s somewhat started me down this path. I took a computer graphics course in my fourth year, and we had to make a little game, and I made this little shoot 'em up game, um, and we had a month to do it, and it was really stressful, and um, for anyone who was in that program, they wouldn't know how stressful that particular project was, but that was sort of like, the first game that I worked on. So <laughs> you enjoyed the stress, huh? Yeah, I definitely, well, I, I don't know if I enjoyed the stress, <laughs> but I enjoyed the output of the stress, which was challenge. That, the, the challenge. And there was like a working game in front of me. And there's actually another member of the team right now who um, graduated from Waterloo as oh, well. Nice. But yeah, fairly recently. So we've already mentioned Mars Attacks. Uh, there was another game for a console, if I remember the title right, Destroy All Humans, which I have on my shelf right oh, over yeah. there, which <laughs> I can almost feel. It's almost like a shot. It kind of feels like a shot-for-shot -shot recreation of one of the, the levels, just from the art style. It's almost yeah. perfect. It's bang-on perfect to the old pulp uh, comics. Yeah, like... We actually heard a lot about that um, yeah. as we were making the game. And when we would go to shows like PAX, there would be fans that would walk up to us and be like, hey, this game looks a lot like Destroy All Humans. And I've definitely heard of the game before. And I've definitely yeah. seen it. But it's one of those ones that I've just never played before. So, um, And I don't think any of us have really ever played it before. But but we've definitely heard it sort of like over and over again, um, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Well, it's... Let, let's get right into what the game is about in case anybody hasn't checked it out, which, by the way, you, you, really, ser you really sincerely should because I, I picked it up totally, I don't want to say by accident, but I picked it up not knowing exactly what I was going to expect. I was kind of expecting like an, uh, an XCOM-style game uh, when someone threw it out <laughs> at me. And then I got into it, and I'm like, this is, this, is, this is more fun than XCOM. I've actually been playing this more then I've been playing XCOM 2, and that was something I've been looking forward to since XCOM on the DOS. Uh, I'm old. Yes, very, very old. Um, but 
that being said, let's get right into it. So you've got two sides. You've got the robots and you've got the humans. And so effectively, this is if you're playing single player. You, you have to protect your rocket. Tell us a little bit about what went into the fiction behind it. Because there is kind of a story mode in the game. Yeah, so um, we... So one of our goals at the beginning was to not have the story be um, a huge part of the game because we felt that um, most of our time and energy should be going into the gameplay. But we were like, hey, it'd be still cool to have this flavoring to the game. So we were like, okay, let's have a very light storyline and it should be fairly simple. It just needs to get the point across. Um, and the idea behind the rockets actually is that um, as the Martians came, the only way to stop them was the humans, they invented these huge rockets and um, they placed them at strategic launch locations um, around the world and they had to launch them up. But in order to do that, they had to have enough time to fire these rockets off. So. Um, Obviously, the Martians knew about this plan, and they started to come after the the rockets. And that's your job in the game is to try to stop the robots from reaching these rockets. So nobody, like, we never really explained this um, in the game. It's sort of just hinted at, or you can extrapolate it on your own. <laughs> but that's kind of the backstory of the game. Do you need a story? You know, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. You've got aliens. You have weapons. Go. You know, exactly. You just—it's all about um, shooting Martians in the 1950s, and that's and that's and sort that's, of like that's pretty epic, dude. Like uh, <laughs> I have to say, um, I like the music you put in the game. I noticed in a couple of your games, you get like original soundtracks done by certain people. I believe in Sector Strike, you had it done by Boneyard Audio. Yes. And uh, I can take it by your games, including this one, Fortify, that you really pride yourself in working on each aspect of the game so far as like the audio, for example. So I guess my question to you is, is how involved are you with the audio? I take it that you, it's very important to you based off of like, I, I know in Tank Hero, you had a, like an original soundtrack in that as well. So what went into the audio for Fortified, I guess? Um, yeah, so for Fortified, we actually found this guy. Um, his, name is, his name is Rom DePrisco. And he's a really talented composer. He's actually here in Toronto. And he, we found that he worked on a bunch of other pretty high profile titles. So he was one of the composers on uh, Gears of War. Oh, nice. Um, and he worked on uh, Guacamole. Yes. Yes. As well. Very so good. we were like, okay, this guy's music is pretty good. And we felt that music was one of the going to be one of the most important parts of trying to sell the theme of this game. Because if it didn't... If it didn't have that 1950s vibe, if it didn't feel like, okay, this is straight out of a movie from the 1950s, it wasn't going to work. So um, we wanted to make sure that we, we, we had someone who was going to be able to pull that off. So um, he's local, so we were able to get him into our office. And after our first meeting, we're like, okay, we think this is our guy. And um, really from there, it just sort of, took off and he and it was actually nice because I think he really understood from the beginning what we were trying to go for so um, a couple of the first tracks that went in there including the battle music was sort of he nailed it like on the first try and nice. um, it was just really really nice working with him he's he's really flexible and one of the, one of the things that's great is that he's he, especially for us as a small team we don't necessarily have the resources of, of, of like a triple a um, game. So when working with him, if we had to like make a lot of changes or if we, um, you know, needed to change our direction, he was flexible enough and very understanding to um, uh, our team size. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's incredible. Like I said, just going over your games, I see the audio is very important to you. That's what I brought it up. Um, speaking of which, like, uh, like, for example, Tekken for me is like important, has a lot of great audio. So my question to you is like, what inspired you to get into the audio so strong as you are now with all your other games? Like what made you like, okay, audio has to be good for all my games. I think a part of that is actually comes from like the art team, um, which is kind of ironic because <laughs> um, what 
many of them always say, which is kind of strange because they work on the visuals, mm -hmm. but they're always like the audio is like 90% of the game and the visuals is like 10%, which I, I still don't really understand that. But, but so um, I think a part of that really comes from that part of the team really pushing hard to make sure that we give the audio the time and attention and the resources that it really needs and they're constantly pushing for it. And we still feel like on Fortified, um, we could have done a few things better and we sort of left some of the sound parts un until until the end, which which is not necessarily like the best thing. So um, it's definitely that part of the team that has been constantly pushing for the audio to be the best it can be. So very nice. Mm -hmm. So tell us tell us a little bit about some of the fun parts of the development. I mean, when you were going through, were, were there any points where you were just thinking, okay, maybe we should retool this? Because every every project usually has that moment, right? Every <laughs> project has that moment where they're like, um, we we can't, we we have to just scrap everything, or we have to scrap a good portion of it and and start from scratch. Were there any moments like that? Uh, yeah, I think the first biggest moment, which um, happened fairly early on is the one that I talked about a little earlier when we had to change the theme of the game pretty drastically and yeah. that required us to basically throw out all the art um, that we did and we had to redo the art and I think another part of the project where that sort of happened was um, for the invasion mode of the game yeah. which if you've played the, the title you know it's yes. sort of like the replayable mode that has a little bit of a survival element. Um, so at the beginning, that was very different from what it is now. It was sort of meant to reuse all the existing maps in the campaign mm -hmm. and sort of just say, okay, you just try to try to like survive as long as you can, which is what a lot of other titles um, that mm -hmm have this sort of like wave based mechanic that yeah, that's it's kind of usually, like an endless endless gauntlet yeah, type of mode yeah exactly and that's what we wanted to do but what we found was that without being able to handcraft the experience um on those on those maps on the campaign maps it just didn't feel that fun it just felt like we were trying to shoehorn in a mode into these maps that weren't made for that mode so mm. um fairly actually fairly close to us wrapping up major production on the game um we still didn't have this mode settled so we we thought we tried a bunch of different things and the thing that kind of stuck with us was okay the philosophy behind the campaign is that you have to go out into the map and explore and find all these places where you you should place these defensive structures and um, we thought, okay, well, what if the philosophy for this other mode was the opposite? So rather than you going out and placing all these structures out on the map, you actually have to try to um, do the opposite and uh, try to build as close to your base as possible. So mm. the goal is you have to really turtle in because the turtling is something that we didn't really want um, to happen in the campaign mode. We didn't want everyone to just use the same strategy, just put all the turrets at the front of the base and you're done, right? So mm -hmm. we're like, okay, well, that philosophy of turtling matches more up with the survival aspect of that mode. Like you're really just trying to make the last stand, survive as long as possible. So uh, we found that worked really well, but we had to really uh, handcraft the maps for that. And another thing was we also wanted there to be a random element. So um, we came up with this idea of uh, gameplay modifiers and I think one of the reasons, I think one of the ideas that sparked that was this idea that it'd be cool if there was one modifier that made some of the robots like three times as large as they are. And nice. I don't know if, if you encounter that, there's like a giant invader modifier and it sort of really fit the theme, like these giant robots marching on the street. So that was definitely like the other point of the project where it was a little bit like we had nothing and then we had to make something happen within a very short period of time. <laughs> well, I, my other question would be, um, when you're in, in the development of this, I see that it's on Xbox One. Uh, was that a hard transition for you? Was it pretty smooth across the board? Like, were you making this game with the intentions of like, okay, this is going to be Xbox One compatible, so we got to, you know, make it with the controller, you know? How, how did that work out for you guys? 
Um, well, I guess first of all, like this has been our largest project by far. I think it was like took us four times towards the end of the project, but we were able to get it done. <laughs> nice. Sorry, no, Mark, uh, Shane, what's that, Eli? Uh, Eli? Are you good now? Are we still good? Okay. Still well, alive. That's fun. Um, anyway, so Mark was just talking about the certification process. Can you give us a little bit more information about that? Because again, we we talk to a lot of indie developers, and they tend to tell us such terrible horror stories <laughs> about some of the certifications going through for Steam and, of course, iOS, uh, the App Store for iPhones, and then the Android Store. Of all of them, which one gave you the least hassle of all the certification processes that you had to go through? Um, well, I'd say that, um, I mean, for sure, PC and Xbox One was a huge step, was a huge step up in terms of challenge and um, uh, from the mobile side of things. Um, between Xbox and Steam, it's kind of, I mean, Steam is definitely a more flexible platform, um, I, I, which I'm sure you guys have heard. Uh, but one of the things that sort of made it difficult to have a point of comparison is that we actually completed most of our development on the Xbox first. So we were able to work out a lot of the kinks in the game. And then we went and worked on the Steam version, the PC version of the game. And at that point, the game was pretty rock solid um, at that point already. We just had to add in the PC specific features, like being able to change all the graphics options um, and, you know, providing uh, PC specific features. So it, it's it's kind of tough to to sort of do a comparison between the right. two. But but I, I think if I just, you know, if I had to sort of give a general answer, it, it definitely be that the consoles, their, um, their quality of standard is like, like a little more strict. It has to um, immediately work. Yeah, like it has to work a hundred, a hundred percent, and and right. which is which makes sense because if you're at home playing on your console, you expect everything to work perfectly. Right. Whereas, you know, you also expect things to work properly on the PC, but because there's so many different variations of hardware, um, it's sort of more flexibility there, I suppose. And going through your game now that it's you know up and running, and I know that this happens a lot with developers, but watching people play the game, like watching everyone play the game now, are they doing things that you didn't anticipate them doing? Or are they finding things out that you're like, ah, I wish you would have found that out? Anything like that? Like anything you didn't see until it went live? Um, yeah, like I think <laughs> it's, you know, it's kind of funny. The, the very first time that we watched some other players streaming the game, we were we were very, very nervous. It, it's the most nerve wracking feeling in the world. <laughs> and it's almost like I think someone on, on our team made the comparison. You know, it's like your baby is trapped in a cage with a bear and there's nothing you can do about it, <laughs> which is <laughs> which is um, sort of what uh, we were feeling. But I think some of the cases that we didn't necessarily anticipate that much were players um, sometimes using the same class um, on a team of like four or something like that. And and we did test those scenarios to make sure everything worked properly. But um, sometimes when you see that happening, there's just so much more like chaos than you expect when there's four rocket scientists and they're all like flying around and, and it's just kind of like, okay, well, that's nice, <laughs> but maybe that's not like how we played the game most of the time. So seeing that is a little bit cool. No, that's awesome. I um, I think that's pretty cool. Like, which which is your class? I guess you can say. What what are you playing? I I definitely like the captain personally, um, because he has most of the uh, infantry structures, and that's sort of one of the parts of the game that we spend a lot of time on. So um, obviously, I'm a little biased, but because we spent all that time on it to make it work properly. I enjoy using the captain a lot. I I have almost exclusively stuck with the agent, to be honest with you. Not just because he has those stylish glasses or anything, but <laughs> I, I've just had so much fun with the fortifications that he had, just to you know plug the title. Uh, I, I'm just a fan of the Tesla coil type launcher. 
uh, especially early in in the early stages of the game. It's still my absolute favorite weapon out of all of the ones that are available. I didn't like playing as the rocket scientist because it felt like it was kind of overpowered to me. To me. Oh wow, that's that's actually a very interesting. You know, it's kind of funny because we always hear like this wide range of feedback, and yeah. and, and we and we've heard that um, you know, like the rocket scientist is a little tough um, really? to uh, play with. And one of the things that we we sort of knew was that um, the rocket scientist, her early game is a little bit tough. Um, but later in the game, she becomes really powerful. So maybe that's, I'm not sure if that's the experience you had, but, you know, it's definitely like a wide range of feedback that we've gotten. But um, the way that we planned her was that in the early game, maybe she's a little bit, hard to play with but at the end of the game she becomes really powerful so i guess my question is which part of um the rock science is that you, you know, feel was too powerful it's it's not that she was tough to play i actually felt like she was a breeze to play because oh, that's I, very interesting <laughs> yeah i mean her her weaponry is basically all on an angle you know her her main weapon when you first start out early in the game is a basically a grenade launcher and a rocket launcher to a point uh I love the fact that her weapon scatters, you know, basically breaks into cluster bombs, but I found that I was just able to clear out enemies way before they ever got to the base. Maybe that's just because I played a lot with the flat cannon in Unreal Tournament, which functions the same <laughs> way, but I just, I, I didn't feel like she was tough to play. I felt like she was overpowered kind of from the start, so I stuck with the agent with the Thompson and the fortifications and the snipers. I, I just had a blast playing with, with that. I pretty much just bounced between the two classes almost exclusively. Yeah, no, I, you know, that's actually one of the biggest challenges that, that, that we had towards the end of the project was trying to get all the four classes in a place where um, they worked, they each worked well in single player and they each worked well in two, three, and four players, and across the three difficulty settings. And 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 it's sort of like you you change one small thing in the system, and everything else sort of um, can be affected by that change. So um, we spent a lot of time there, but even now, it's still like another big factor that we didn't account for is is the play style. Um, you know, a lot of different players have a different style and um, because of that that's sort of another factor that sometimes you know certain characters may feel more powerful to some players and then they may feel not as powerful for some other players so it's just definitely something that we still are working on and you know <laughs> just yeah well it's funny that you bring up that you're still working on it I know the game came out like on February 3rd and uh, by February 11th you've already like did a patch so that has me thinking that you guys are like on this like all the time. So how is that at the moment? You guys just like constantly watching it, trying to fix a ton of different things, or I'm sure you guys are all frantic right now about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was really it was really hectic um, on launch week and the week after that, and it's kind of like slowed down slightly. But one of the things is we definitely want to make sure that um, any of the major issues are worked out first, and then afterwards. Um, we might take a look at some of the other issues like the game balance mm -hmm. and such, but um, we're definitely, it's not in our culture to just launch a game and then, um, you know, not ever touch it again. And, you know, that's not to say that, that we're going to be putting out like a whole ton of content or anything like that. Like we're still actually working out the plan for that because we just, we literally just launched a game like a few weeks ago and we're sort of taking a breather and and figuring out what's next but i think at the minimum we're going to make sure that we um we try to address any any issues that um may make you know for example on the pc yeah. there were several major issues at the beginning with the voice chat and people wanted to be able to chat with their keyboards, so that's something that we address very early on in our second patch, and it's those sort of issues that we're focused on first. And then once are once those are done, then maybe we will take a look at some of the other stuff. Um, yeah. 
And regard, I mean, the reviews for this has been incredibly positive. Um, how does that make you feel knowing that, like, when you're going checking out these reviews, that you know it's coming back like really, really good for you? Um, I, it's kind of, it's kind of a mixed feeling because I think like we're always very nervous, and and you know, like, there's been good reviews and there's been some like mixed reviews, so it's always. Um, it's always a little bit nerve wracking when reading the reviews, but our philosophy is um, here is that we sort of, the reviews we care the most about are the user reviews first, and then we care about the critics, and then we care about after that, I guess like everything else, right? Um, right. And so far the user reviews have been pretty positive, so that's definitely, we feel like we met our goals there, okay. but yeah. Can you even play? Like, and when I ask this question, can you even play the game? Like, uh, like when you're playing it, are you too busy going, "Oh my God, look at this little part right here"? Or can you actually enjoy it? Um, it it's definitely tough, especially after playing the game so much. Mm -hmm. I think at the first week, like ooh, we had played so much Fortified that um, it was difficult to play any more of it. But I think after being away from the game for a while, it, it's definitely a little easier and you definitely are constantly um very critical about everything in the game as you're playing like you'll notice things that like users would never notice in the game like <laughs> you will look at like a texture on a wall and be like that 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 texture that texture looks like crap and like nobody <laughs> nobody ever mentioned anything about it but um but yeah so so of any of everybody that's on the team, I'm sure everybody has clocked in a lot of time playing the game. Who who's pretty much the champ of the office at this point? <laughs> Who, who's well, got the most under their belt? The boss is right. Well, not always. <laughs> no, I actually I I'm actually one of the worst um, players on the team. I'm not the worst, but I'd say I'm like one of the worst. But there's this one um, there's, there's just one member of the team. He he was actually just like a part time guy on the project and uh he helped us with a lot of the play testing um and with a lot of the game balance and he's had hundreds of hours on the game and he is by far the best he beat um insane mode on his own he like soloed it and 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 he's played through with every character he's beat the game in every single combination you can possibly think of and it was, and it was kind of funny because um we had this joke like, hey, uh, so like, what are we going to get you as your Christmas present? And we're like, we're going to get you a copy of Fortified. <laughs> He's like, no, 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 I don't want that. I played too much Fortified. So, um, yeah. So That's you're basically, if I can say this, you're basically the grease stain on every map is what you're basically saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Did, um, so how's like I'm sure like your friends and family have been very supportive. I'm sure they've played a lot of Fortified over the last few uh, times. You guys like getting a, you know getting it started up. How was that like for your friends and family to join you? Um, it's really yeah. I mean it's really exciting when um, I think a lot of us that was one of the that was one of the things at the end of the project that was very nice to have is hey we can finally go and. Um, we can like send our friends, you know, like free copies of the game, and um, they're able to see what we've been working on for the last two years. And um, they've been really, really supportive. Like the parents of one of the artists sent us like a case of beer, nice. um, which <laughs> which is really <laughs> awesome. They're like, "Hey, congratulations on finishing the game." Um, and 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 his parents lives down in a. South America, so it's kind of like they they sent us this case of beer, and it was oh, wow. and it was just this, it was just really nice, just just knowing that um, you know, like your family friends are there, and when you're when you're finished with this long and stressful process uh, project, they're able to to say, hey, you know, like um, I'm glad that you guys finished, and that and they're able to try out the game, so. No, that has to be a wonderful experience to finally say, "Hey guys, look, it's done." So, and just yeah. to enjoy it, just to enjoy it with them, I'm sure is like a great, great experience for you. Yeah. So, as the resident lush on on staff, I can honestly attest I have played this game under the influence of a few things: uh, rum, <laughs> uh, vodka, twelve um, year old rum, more rum. 
I have to say that my accuracy goes up with each shot. So, <laughs> shot of shot of liquor, not shot in the game. Shot in the game, it's it's all over the place. But it it, it really is one of those games where co op. This this game mm-hmm. is practically built for co-op it is built for co-op so how have things gone with that because a a multiplayer game as as many games come out we always say one of two things we either say oh this game needs multiplayer or this game does not need multiplayer so it's not as easy as most would think to put together a multiplayer game what are some of the troubles that you've had with that kind of thing um yeah i yeah that's a good question i think the biggest challenge by far was with the game balancing, um, especially with a small team. Being able to test a four-player game um, was a huge problem for us, a huge challenge. And um, at the beginning, our first step in trying to trying to address that was to bring the game to as many shows as we could, to try to put it in front of a large audience. And we had a four-player setup. At PAX, so we were able to sort of get some idea about what an outside group of four players would feel um, would feel with the game. So, and it was especially helpful when a group of uh, four friends would step out to our booth at PAX and try out the game. And it was really positive feedback when they would come back the next day and be like, "Hey, we want to try the game on like a harder level or something like that." So. That was sort of the first step, but it really um, it got to it got to this point of the project later on where we knew that the testing was so hard, so we started to get help from outside. So we actually made um, a post through social media and other channels, like, "Hey, if you if you're interested in helping us play test this game, um, we're doing play tests with the public over the next." two weeks and we actually got a huge reception for that. We had uh, 20 to 30 people uh, come to our office and help us play test. Um, And even beyond that, we we end up going to a local college, uh, George Brown College, which is a college here in Toronto. And we were, and one of um, the staff members there was nice enough to lend us a classroom and we were able to um, get a whole classroom to try out the game um, for uh, so so sort of but that was the challenge is how can we be how can we be resourceful enough as a small team to be able to play properly play test a four player game and that was definitely the biggest challenge and and talking about the multiplayer which I think is awesome that you went in four player co-op but often I read in multiplayer, the most difficult thing is the maps, right? Um, what helped you guys? I'm sure at some point the maps were either too big or too small. How was that challenge trying to come up with something that, okay, the scenery is not going to be boring over and over again? Yeah, so so when it came so when it came to the maps, we felt like what we found was there's really no way around it um, in a lot of cases. Um, you really have to make something and watch it fail and then you gotta try again and we found that you can try to plan out a bunch of levels which we did but it would usually amount to we would try out um, a bunch of levels and probably less than half of them would actually make the cut and um, one of the things that we did find because at the beginning of the project we were thinking oh the later levels are going to be really complicated there's going to be all these paths and like mazes and all this like crazy stuff. But we actually found that the more complicated it got, um, it wasn't as fun. Like it wasn't very clear for the player what was happening. And in a strategy game like Fortified, um, the clarity is like super important. You need to know where Mm -hmm. things are and you need to be able to formulate a strategy in your mind. You can only do that if the map was clear, right? Um, Mm -hmm. So we, we actually found that we actually found that reducing the complexity of the maps was really the key um, to making them fun. And it was always sort of finding the balance between, OK, how complicated can we make it without it being a confusing map? 
I actually kind of found that the the best way to play the game was to just make this weird, screwed up Rube Goldberg machine where <laughs> the enemy the enemies would run through. Okay, first the very basic uh, defenses, then they might get hit by something else, and then so on and so forth. It was almost like you were just basically trying to snowball your attacks. And one of the most satisfying moments was where it got to the point where I only had to maybe fire off a few shots if I was really, really not prepared, and that was it. I could just stand back and, and watch, but I never really got to the point where I felt like, oh, well, this is just this is just the same old thing. This is boring. I, I always, in every map, even in the later stages, I always felt like something was going to either overwhelm me and just totally decimate me, or it would get a lucky shot peeled off, and then I would have to very quickly rebuild my defenses while getting mobbed at the same time. So how how difficult was it? You mentioned balance a couple of times already, but how, <laughs> how difficult is it to really balance that between doing the AI thing and then getting four human beings in a map? Like, what are the, what are the big challenges there? Well, yeah, like, um, yeah, so like how I mentioned, I think that, you know, I think for us, it, it always got, it always went back to trying something out first mm -hmm. and um, seeing whether or not it works or not. And and like um, that sort of like there wasn't really much way around that. Um, and and then on top of that, just 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 trying to get as many players as possible to try out the uh, game. And um, it's just sort of this long process that you have to go through and then for sure at the end of the um at the end of the project you start to sort of get a handle on certain things that might work and um certain things that don't quite work that well like one of the things we found was that um using roads became part of the visual language of the maps and we found that when there wasn't a road it would be like slightly confusing to the players and it they wouldn't really be able to, um, it wouldn't be as clear to them that that was a path that the robots will be marching down. So we tried to use that um, as part of the language of the game and to try to put that in as many places as we could. So it's sort of like you learn, you, you, you start off with the least amount of information and you do a lot of trial and error. And then through that trial and error, you start to figure out what works and what doesn't and then you have like a bag of tricks there and then using those bag of tricks later on later on down the road um it, it becomes more of a smoother process so how much of a masochist does one have to be in order to go through <laughs> a four-player game with nothing but rocket uh rocket scientists i'm, I'm curious because that just has to be straight out chaos every which way yeah, and, and sometimes we're almost worried that the game is going to like fall apart when um, all four <laughs> rocket scientists, they all fire their supers or their heroic power off, off at the same time, and they're all blasting their rockets. But 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 surprisingly, it's uh, held it's uh, held together. But I don't know who would do that. I've seen it once. No? And <laughs> it's, it's, we're we're gamers. We like stuff yeah. that goes boom, sir. That's kind of <laughs> how that works. It. So no. was there a particular thing that you designed that you're like super proud of in the game? Like obviously outside from being proud of the game, but is there a particular item in there, weapon or move that you're like, yeah, I came up with that. I'm so happy for that. Yeah, I I, I feel like the infantry system um, was something that I guess like it wasn't me personally who came up with that, but something that we came up with a team that we're super proud of because it wasn't really something that we've seen in other um, similar games, um, being able to sort of move your units across um, the map in like a defense game. Usually your defenses are very static. You just kind of place them and you sort of like forget about them after. But that was like the major twist in our game is that um, you're able to react on the fly and you're able to sort of have these structures that move. Um, and, and that was also one of the hardest things for us to make work properly, um, and and I think that's the thing that I'm I'm, I'm personally like the the most proud of. I'm oh, good. That's awesome. Is uh, and the other thing I would have to ask is uh, 
when you were talking about the art direction and stuff that you were looking at, when was it when you like you said that when you found when you started looking at the 1950, you're like, OK, this is what we have to go. But was there like a particular art piece where you were just like, oh, my God, this is it. This is where we're going. I Yeah, I think it was definitely um, it was definitely the two things I mentioned previously, but specifically within those references. It was that one scene in Sky Captain and the World Tomorrow when those large robots, they land on the streets and they're fighting like the US military. And that was sort of this one very um, strong like visual that, 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 that sort of stuck with us. And then the other one was um, in uh, the cover, the cover, the covers of Magnus, a Magnus robot fighter. If you just do a search for, for that comic and look at any of the covers there, um, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's awesome. It's, yeah. I, was, I guess I was, my question is, was there, is there any moments when you're at home and you're like, it's about to go to bed and all of a sudden you wake up and you're like, oh, I got an idea. Like, how does that work out for you? Like when you're at your house or chilling, all of a sudden you got this really great idea and you're not even at the office. Yeah, that's, well, it's kind of funny because I find that, that that's when, um, that's when the solutions to a lot of problems or when a lot <laughs> of the ideas will, will actually happen is when you're uh, either taking a shower or like you're you know, like you're walking home from the subway or right before you sleep. And the right before you sleep thing is like the worst because <laughs> you're kind of tired and you're kind of like dozing off, but you're like, I know I'm, I know I'm going to forget this tomorrow. So I usually have like my smartphone right there. So if I think of something <laughs> before I sleep, <laughs> I still like write it down quickly and then like I doze off. But um, <laughs> that's, yeah, that, that's definitely happened a lot. So, just to do a real quick plug for ourselves for a second, there is a thing that we have recently gotten into. Uh, if you go to opnoobs.com, our website, you can see a review on oh. the site. Yeah. But uh, here's the thing. I When I was playing this, I was thinking, my God, yeah. this would be this this would be a fun competitive game. How do you feel about competitive multiplayer games in the indie scene we don't have a lot of those right now i mean we have we have a lot of uh competition sure but we don't have really any any tournaments so if you go to our site opnoobs.com we we have a thing called esports for indie i'm gonna have, kind of put you on the on the spot right now uh <laughs> is this a game that you can see uh, if you expand on it do you ever foresee this kind of thing turning into like a tournament based game um, I guess the quick short answer is would be no, um, because one thing that we're really big on is sort of having a clear vision about what the game is trying to do at the very beginning. And, and we try hard not to stray too much from that. Um, and right from the beginning, we knew that Fortified was going to be a co-op game first. And um, and but having said that, though, there have been times during the project where someone has brought up an idea of like, hey, what if you could fight each other or something like that? But um, we've always, in those situations, the thing that made us choose not to do that was like, okay, hey, let's just take all the energy we can and put it into the co-op experience because that's um, what we feel like the game is all about. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I definitely feel that in the indie space, um, multiplayer, both co-op and PvP is 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 an area where I think a lot of the innovation is going to come from um, in the next uh, in the next in the next few years. It's a little bit harder to do multiplayer games um, for small teams, like for for some of the reasons that I mentioned. But I definitely feel that that's something that we're interested in and. Maybe not for Fortified, but, you know, maybe for something else, we, 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 it's on the table. <laughs> yeah. it's, I, I, when, I, when I first fired this up, the first thing that kind of popped in my mind was, oh, my God, this is Left for Dead with Aliens. <laughs> this, it, it just seems to me like it would be absolutely perfect. And I, I think we have a very serious lack of co-op games. And we have a lot of competitive I agree. games. But I, I think it's one of those things that we've – kind of lost sight on uh just to get kind of soapboxy philosoph philosophical for a minute we're so busy trying to blow everybody else up why not just join other people to destroy other people 
you know well yeah. why do we not have a lot of that i mean is it is it a technical issue uh that uh indie developers have is it that they want to branch out from the you know uh gun simulator 2016 like all the triple <laughs> a titles are generally doing what what do you think it is as someone that is pretty deep in the industry as a game maker yourself um so just to clarify, are you saying that there aren't enough co-op titles or in my not opinion, enough multi- In my opinion, it's a little bit of both. I mean, yes, I've, a lot of games have online multiplayer, but a lot yeah. of them tend to be more of the, you know, you are your own island where you are attacking other people. Uh, I don't think, me personally, I don't play a whole lot of multiplayer unless you count MMOs. I usually Mm -hmm. play primarily single player, but this is one of those games where I would just like to grab a friend, grab a bunch of people, queue up for a server, and just go to town on somebody. Yeah, I think that, um, I think that, well, I mean, I'm not quite sure, you know, why there might be more Mm -hmm. um, multiplayer games that are co-op versus uh, PvP, but Mm -hmm. I definitely feel that, like, multiplayer in general, it is is something that is much harder, much harder to do as a small team. Mm. It, it it's it's just like you can, if you were to take the, the amount of effort that you put into making something work in multiplayer, um, you'd be able to spend like, you'd be able to, you'd be able to make a game. I would say um, that is single player in half the time you would in making a multiplayer game. Um, so I, you know, I think that that might be the reason why multiplayer is not as big. Um, but between co-op and PvP, I, I kind of not really sure. Actually, I, I feel like, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I have, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, um, just real quick, um, I was wondering, how did you determine your difficulty like scale? Like you were saying, there's different uh, skill levels in, in the office. Um, at what point do you realize something is, okay, this is too hard versus, okay, maybe we're just not good enough and we need to get better? Yeah, so we definitely always err on the side of making making it too hard, um, especially for a game like Fortified, uh, because in a game like Fortified, that's sort of the point of the game. Like, you're trying, you're trying to defend your base and you're trying to make the last stand, and if you make the game, if it's not hard enough, the game gets like really boring fast. So um, as a rule of thumb, it's sort of like if we're, if, you know, if there's a debate like, hey, someone thinks this is like too hard and someone thinks this is too easy, we will always sort of be like, okay, well, if someone thinks it's too easy, it's still too easy then. Let's make it harder. So we're always sort of on that side of things. Gotcha. And I know it's a little bit off topic, but real quick, um, outside of Fortified, what is like your game? I guess you can say, what is your favorite game growing up? The game that like got you into gaming? Um, I, I feel like, I feel like there's been, um, sort of a shift in, in, in my taste over the years. I tend to play a, a, a lot more multiplayer games now. Um, when I was small, oh geez, I, I played, I played everything. I've been playing PC games um since like 1990 um nice. even slightly slightly before that so i you know it's definitely been a there's been a whole bunch of games um i've been a huge fan of uh unreal tournament the first one that was one of my favorite games back then and i remember it came with like the map editor too i don't know if you guys have ever you know yes. messed around yes. with that totally yes. before yeah. but um <laughs> That <laughs> that was definitely one of my favorite games um, when I was small. Nice. So uh, I'm I'm being pinged that we have to release you back into the wild very shortly, sir. So uh, <laughs> let me do the next bit of pitching. So the game is Fortified. Uh, it is on Steam right now. It is worth every single penny that I paid for it. It's worth every one of your pennies as well. Go buy it. Uh, but that being said, what is in the future? for fortified actually what's in the what's in the future for clapfoot uh this is your first game released on uh on pc on on steam specifically 
uh, are you going to do more of these? Are you going to kind of take a, a brief hiatus and go back to mobile? What are what are the future plans? Um, I think for sure our future is in uh, console and PC. We okay. we had a lot of um, fun working on Fortified, and this is where we want to be. Um, we're going to continue to support Fortified and. We're also going to be working on new things. We we're already starting to experiment with um, some ideas, but um, and I think one of the things that we're that we're really focused on is trying to bring some of the innovation in multiplayer that I, I was talking about a little earlier. Um, we feel that there is a lot of things in multiplayer to be explored, and that's where we want to be exploring. So I noticed with uh, the tank game, you had not really an expansion per se, but you, you did have a, another kind of side chapter for that one. Is there anything that you want to add to Fortified in the future? I mean, not DLC. to say not to say to go the route of paid DLC or anything. <laughs> By the way, I appreciate the fact that you released a game complete with an actual single pl single player <laughs> mode since there are some developers that don't do that right. kept comp um <laughs> with that being said um is there anything that you would like to add into the game that didn't quite make it before release something we might look um, forward to well i i mean like i said we're, we're still planning things out so there's you know nothing officially to talk about but i feel like um something that we might be interested in um you know again without any promise because we still got to plan out everything is that we'd be interested in adding a little bit more content uh to the game um just to sort of have something for players who want to come back to the game after they be in the campaign um, so that that's something that we're interested in. So we're 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 working out the plan um, right now. So, well, as far as I can tell, there's a lot of replay value. I, this is one of those games where I can just pick up and play. And if I want to blow off steam, I can. If I want to get totally smashed, I can. That's and right. if I want to get destroyed in game, I can. So. As, as far as I'm concerned, this is just one of those games. I'll do my unofficial review right now. It's it's totally worth it. It's worth it. very simple, very simple to learn, very difficult to master. You will die. You will die multiple times, or you might just breeze <laughs> on through. It all depends on play style, which is one of those things that I think is sorely lacking. But, Mark, thank you so much for taking time out. I'm sorry we got a little bit late, uh, a little bit of a late start. Uh, appreciate you hanging out with us. Shane, do you have anything else to say? Uh, no, thanks, Mark, for coming here. Thanks for giving us the uh, time of day. Uh, I think the best part about your company is that your security officer is a, is a, is a puppy. That's awesome. <laughs> That's like the best Lots. part. <laughs> and, Every guy uh, needs cool. a puppy. And, and uh, before you go, on Hero Forge, uh, last question before you go, what do you, uh, what's, your, what's your class? Uh, I like the Paladin. Paladin, all right. Yeah, I like yeah. Paladin as well. Well, that is all we got time for today. We're going to release Mark back into the wilds of Canada, into that cathedral that he's apparently <laughs> broadcasting from. <laughs> so from all of us at OP Noobs, check us out, opnoobs.com. Check out the e for i tab if you want to know more about what we're doing in the realm of esports. Shane, Mark... Eli, the guy that can't actually speak right now, I'm Steven, so thank you for joining us, everybody. Have a good day. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Hey, thank you, man. Eli, keep us live. Do it. Kill us.